Welcome, welcome everybody to the third and final lecture in the 2021 series of Green Templeton Lectures. My name is Marshall Young and I am an Emeritus Fellow at Green Templeton College and I am chairing the lectures this year. I must first ask those who have attended an earlier lecture to be patient while I quickly explain the background of the lectures to those attending for the first time. The background to these lectures is quite simple. Like most Oxford colleges, Green Templeton hosts numerous lectures throughout the year that address the specialist academic interests of its professors and students. However, each year the college picks a theme of contemporary interest and then arranges three lectures aimed at a broader audience of interested but non-specialist parties outside the college. This year, the COVID pandemic is an inescapable contemporary theme. Over a year, as of mid-2021, the world is still in the grip of the COVID-19 pandemic and governments around the world are still scrambling to contain the impact of the pandemic. The public health interventions they have had to undertake have had a major knock-on effect on their economies, thus giving citizens major economic as well as major health worries. One notable feature of the pandemic is that as citizens try to make sense of how the pandemic is progressing and, more particularly, how effectively their governments are managing its impact on their lives, they have been subject to a tsunami of conflicting commentary. This has come from scientists, journalists, pundits of different hues and, of course, politicians. So Green Templeton, drawing on its research base in medicine, public policy and management, decided to use this latest lecture series to try to provide an opportunity for the intelligent non-specialists to stand back and reflect on some of the deeper issues the frenetic experience of the last 12 months has raised. In particular, what are some of the key questions they should have for their governments when they come up with the inevitable Build Back Better plan for recovering from COVID? Under the overall title of Navigating the COVID Challenge, the series comprises three lectures that, that explore different aspects of the challenge. These range from framing the coronavirus challenge to key lessons for recovery strategies to the challenge of ensuring the policy frameworks adopted secure genuine progress towards the better future that these strategies always promise. Green Templeton College is delighted that these 2021 lectures are being supported by the Franklin Templeton Investment Institute, the research group within the fund manager Franklin Templeton. And yes, the Templeton that features in both our names does refer to the same Sir John Templeton, the renowned investor and philanthropist. Today we move on to our third lecture, which looks to the challenge of developing the effective policy needed if any of the strategies for building back better are to be credible and to have any chance of actually being realized. I'm delighted we have been able to arrange for Professor Joseph Stiglitz to give this third lecture. We have provided a copy of his impressive CV on the web pages describing these lectures, so I will not list all his achievements. I will just note that his career has encompassed a highly distinguished career in academia, duly recognized in his Nobel Prize, and some seven years in top-level policymaking in Washington with the Clinton administration and the World Bank. He has become a noted critic of many aspects of traditional policy development and an advocate for new and improved approaches to policy development. He is also a much sought-after international expert on this whole issue of effective policy development. He therefore brings an unusual breadth of experience to the task we have asked him to address tonight, namely to reflect on the limitations he feels are holding back much current policy development and how they might be addressed so that governments really do manage to deliver on their promises to build back better. I would now like to introduce Professor Joseph Stiglitz and ask him to begin the lecture that he has kindly agreed to present tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, uh, uh, and I hope uh, in one of the coming years I'll be able to do. Uh, the topic I was asked to talk about is uh, measuring progress towards a, a better post-COVID economy, a better post-COVID world. Uh, 
COVID-19 has exposed many weaknesses uh, in our economy, uh, in our societies. Uh, COVID-19 has not been what might be called an equal opportunity um, uh, virus. It, it has uh, gone after those who are uh, poor, who have poor health, and those disproportionately, particularly in the United States, are those who are at the bottom of the income and wealth scale. Uh, it has uh, uh, exposed those inequalities and unfortunately exacerbated them. Uh, the United States may have uh, the highest level per capita income among the large advanced countries, but we were more ravished by COVID-19 um, than other advanced countries. And uh, that reflects some of the basic inadequacies in our economic framework. Uh, it uh, demonstrates that GDP is not a necessarily a good measure of societal well-being, um, of sustainability, resilience, um, and uh, in, it exposed, uh, COVID-19 exposed uh, not only the inequalities, but many other uh, deficiencies in our economic and social system. Uh, not only are there, were there large inequalities in income and wealth that I had written about and others have written about uh, uh, over the recent years, um, the largest among the advanced countries, but it also uh, exposed the inequalities in health because the United States uh, does not recognize access to medicine as a basic human right. Um, and because we don't have anything like uh, the National Health Service that you are fortunate to have in the UK, uh, the uh, disparities in health are larger than in any other of the major advanced countries. Uh, even worse, um, average health is actually poor. Life expectancy is at the lowest among the major advanced countries and is in decline. Uh, even before the uh, COVID-19, life expectancy in the United States was lower in 2019 than it was five years earlier. COVID-19 also exposed uh, the lack of resilience of uh, the economy's private sector. Uh, the United States couldn't even produce simple products like masks and protective gear, let alone more complicated products like uh, um, uh, tests and, and ventilators. Uh, one of the reasons we couldn't respond so well is in our uh, strive for greater, quote, efficiency, uh, we didn't take account of risk. We were excessively short-sighted. The private sector particularly was short-sighted. And that was demonstrated in 2008 and again in 2020. It was, uh, we, you know, we prided ourselves uh, it, it, that we had uh, taken out the spare tires from our cars. Um, most of the time, those spare tires aren't used. But the reason you have a spare tire is that sometimes you get a flat tire. And if you get a flat tire uh, when you're uh, miles away from a nearest gas station, uh, uh, the cost can be enormous. And our whole economic system was based on this short-termism that uh, did not give adequate attention to the risk that we faced. And that resulted in an economy that was not adequately resilient. The public sector was also unable to respond fully to uh, the risk that we confronted. That too was not an accident. 
40 years of neoliberalism, 40 years by uh, the uh, uh, policies of Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the United States, uh, denigrating the role of government meant that government couldn't fulfill the functions that it's supposed to and has to fulfill. Uh, the United States had one of the best uh, agencies for dealing with infectious disease, the Centers for Disease Control. It had helped countries around the world develop similar institutions. But under President Trump, the CDC was defunded. The United States was aware of the dangers of uh, a pandemic like SARS or like the COVID-19 that we face today. And within the White House, President Obama set up a, uh, within the National Security Council, uh, an office to deal with pandemics, respond to pandemics. But in the short-sightedness of the Trump administration, that office was disbanded. It was a concerted effort to weaken the government and it succeeded and meant that we were less able to respond to the pandemic when it occurred. There are other aspects of uh, uh, our society our, uh, and our economy that COVID-19 ex exposed. Um, there was a lack of trust of citizens in each other and of citizens in our institutions. Lack of respect for each other. COVID-19, like other public health and like uh, global warming, entails externalities. What one person does has effects on others. If individuals didn't wear masks, it exposed others to the risk of life, the risk of getting the disease. Unfortunately, too many people in the United States focused on their own selfish, what they would call liberty, their freedom. But one person's freedom is another person's unfreedom. Uh, when one person exercises his right not to wear a mask, he actually impairs the other person's right to life because he exposes that other person to the risk of getting the disease that could actually take away his life. And in our complex society, we balance these two. And the way they were balanced by too many people focused excessively on the selfish desires on the, rather than on the collective good of the whole. And finally, the COVID-19 exposed the lack of competency of many of our institutions, including the public, public institutions, as I, as I said, a result of 40 years of denigrating the important roles of government. There are contrasts between countries around the world. Some countries managed the pandemic, much better than others. Some countries managed the aftermath, the economic aftermath of the pandemic much better than others. And while in different stages, some countries did better and other stages, others, uh, it's not a controlled experiment, but we have a wealth of data, uh, data that will, I'm sure will be used by uh, social scientists, epidemiologists, to study what makes for a better response and how we can dis design responses better in the future. But just very broadly, as we look across the world, we see a couple countries stand out as uh, excelling in both the response to the disease and the economic aftermath. Uh, New Zealand uh, is an example. And uh, it was a country that, uh, uh, in which every one of the weaknesses that I mentioned before had been addressed well before COVID-19. Uh, it was a country with less inequalities, better health, um, more trust 
in government and of citizens in each other. And uh, they were able to respond effectively to contain the disease and to contain the economic consequences. Now, as we assess our economy, our society, it's very clear that is that GDP is not an adequate summary statistic of how well we are doing, how well we are prepared to confront the risks that we face going forward. I've been involved in a part of a global effort to develop better metrics, uh, beginning with a commission I chaired uh, uh, set up by the president of uh, France before the 2008 crisis, uh, and then continued uh, at uh, the o OECD. Uh, uh, international commissions and a high level commission on the measurement of economic, prog uh, economic performance and social progress. Uh, I believe uh, this kind of uh, effort is important because what you measure affects what you do. If we measure the wrong thing, we'll do the wrong thing. If we focus our attention on increases in material well-being, uh, that's what our society will focus its attention on. If we don't measure environmental degradation, uh, that environmental degradation uh, will go forward apace. Uh, I became involved in some of these efforts when I was a member and then chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton. Uh, we tried then with the Department of Commerce, the Bureau of Economic Affairs, uh, to develop a, a, a better metrics of resource depletion and environmental degradation. I knew that we were on to something important when the coal lobby uh, in Congress uh, got together and said, uh, in effect, that if we continued to do our work developing metrics, better metrics of environmental degradation, they would cut off all funding uh, to us. Um, we knew why they were concerned, because if we measured environmental degradation better, we would it would provide an important impetus to curtailing the coal industry. Well, these better metrics are particularly important right now because uh, we are in the process of trying to build back better. Uh, we want to not go back to where we were in January 2020, uh, back to a world marked by the high levels of inequality, uh, lack of resilience, uh, uh, a world where we weren't dealing adequately with uh, climate change. Um, and so uh, we, we need to have better metrics to assess the success that we have in building back better. Uh, part of this is uh, to recognize that we will have to make sure that the enormous amounts of money that we are spending to help resuscitate the economy does double and triple duty. Not only does the money have to help resuscitate the economy, that's obviously absolutely essential. It has to protect the most vulnerable. That too is absolutely essential. But it has to uh, uh, also help restructure the economy, help to move us towards a greener, more knowledge-based economy and society. Uh, and uh, it has to help us uh, create a more inclusive, equal society. Uh, some of my research uh, uh, done with uh, Cameron Hepburn here at Oxford and his colleagues and Nick Stern at LSE shows that there are an ample set of projects that can actually uh, serve these uh, double and triple duty that in fact can achieve all those objectives in a timely way 
and with high multipliers giving uh, what we say is a, a big bang for the buck. Um, well, I wanna spend the uh, next few minutes uh, on the broader issue is of how do we assess whether we are being successful in building back better? And uh, uh, an important element of that is that we aren't going to find a single number, a single metric that can encapsulate anything as complex as our society or the multiple objectives that I just described. Uh, that's one of the uh, big failings of GDP itself. It tries to summarize in one number something that's far too complex uh, that can't be summarized in a single number. That's why uh, the commission, which I chair, uh, argued that you needed uh, a dashboard, uh, a whole series of metrics uh, capturing, reflecting uh, success in health, in the environment, sustainability, in security, uh, in all the dimensions that are important to uh, society, to various parts of our society. And in fact, uh, we argued that a democratic dialogue on what should be included in such a dashboard could actually be very constructive in helping uh, form a, a broader consensus on where uh, we as a society should be going. So uh, a very important part of that is, of course, uh, the green transition. Uh, are the uh, reductions in emissions on target to achieve uh, the, the goals that we know uh, have to be achieved? Um, the, we now know that if we are to manage uh, uh, with a high likelihood of getting down to one half, two degrees centigrade uh, uh, learning temperature change to that, those limits, we have to get down to carbon neutrality, uh, net zero by uh, 2050. And uh, we can measure uh, how well we are doing in that. Um, in that sense, that's, we, know, we know what efficient trajectories are likely to look like to get to that goal from where we are now. And we can see how we are departing from those trajectories how delay is going to be costly and how uh, the extent to which we are uh, uh, imposing additional costs uh, on the future. Uh, that's an example of using uh, physical metrics, uh, not just dollar metrics. Uh, converting that physical metric into dollars may not be a useful exercise. Uh, uh, the important point is that we are on a trajectory that gets us to net neutrality by 2050. Similarly, health is an area where uh, health statistics, looking at uh, mortality, morbidity, may be much more useful uh, than uh, trying to uh, uh, convert these into dollar equivalents. Um, as I noted earlier, one of the reasons why the United States was so vulnerable to COVID-19 was the large levels of health disparities. Uh, and we have data with which we can assess uh, those health disparities. Uh, the research of uh, uh, Case and Deaton uh, showing uh, the high level of uh, deaths of despair that have marked the United States over the last decade, have called attention to uh, a major social phenomena uh, in the United States uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, this kind of data uh, can give us a sense of what we what, of, of our success uh, in combating what is a, a clearly a sign of uh, a, a social dysfunction. Um, 
other dimensions of assessing uh, the extent of our success uh, are going to be more difficult. Um, for instance, um, inequality, uh, inequalities that I referred to earlier have uh, so many dimensions to them. Uh, there's no single metric that can adequately reflect uh, all these dimensions of just this one aspect of uh, so social progress and economic performance. Um, and statistics often used is a Gini coefficient. Uh, it too is a summary statistic. And obviously we should be concerned when the Gini coefficient uh, is increasing. But the Gini coefficient doesn't describe, uh, provide the information that we really need to assess what is happening to inequalities within our society. Uh, it doesn't assess, for instance, the extent to which the top 1% or the top one tenth of 1% is garnering an increasingly larger fraction of national income and national wealth. It doesn't uh, reflect adequately uh, the increasing numbers of people, fractions of our population in poverty or the extent of poverty, the fraction of the population that is living paycheck to paycheck um, that uh, faces uh, a, a kind of vulnerability and insecurity um, that uh, can be so corrosive of uh, individual well-being. Uh, that summary statistic also doesn't reflect the way inequalities cut across various parts of our society. In the United States, uh, the events of the last year have made us uh, aware of uh, the persistent racial and ethnic discrimination, um, the uh, uh, effects of systemic racism in our society. Uh, the election of Trump made us much more aware of geographical, geographic disparities across our country. And these uh, geographic, ethnic, and racial disparities have enormous social and political consequences, which we've see, seen playing, played out. They also have very large economic consequences. So it is important as uh, we proceed uh, to evaluate our, uh, me uh, to measure our progress towards a better post-COVID uh, society, that we pay attention to all of these uh, various dimensions of inequality. One dimension of uh, progress that also is not adequately captured in our GDP statistics is clearly very important, is security. Uh, many people within our societies face high levels of insecurity. Uh, high probabilities, uh, individuals who are above the poverty line falling below. Uh, even people uh, in the middle worry about uh, falling into poverty. Uh, many people feel that they're uh, one, uh, uh, one problem away uh, from uh, uh, economic uh, disaster. Um, there are many ways that we can go about measuring this uh, insecurity. There are objective measures looking at the probabilities of different individuals in different positions actually uh, facing uh, the kinds of extreme hardships uh, that we know uh, confront many parts of our society. But there are also subjective measures uh, assessing how people feel about uh, uh, their situation, how secure they feel, how vulnerable they feel. And one important uh, research agenda is to try to link 
uh, the objective measures and the subjective measures to try to understand what are the determinants of both the objective and the subjective measures, and in turn, to ask how these uh, senses of insecurity affect uh, broader macroeconomic performance. Individuals, uh, workers that are feeling secure can't uh, devote the energies, the concentration that they need to perform their job well. And so uh, many of the things I've talked about, not only security, but health, uh, while they have obvious implications for individual well-being, uh, they also have important implications for overall economic performance. Finally, there are another dimension of uh, uh, success, uh, uh, societal uh, progress and, and economic performance is trust. I mentioned one of the reasons that some societies performed so much more poorly in response to COVID-19 was the lack of trust of individuals in each other and in institutions. Uh, that lack of trust, of course, has broader economic consequences. Uh, the commission uh, that I chaired in a high level panel at the OECD that I chaired, a uh, co-chaired, uh, emphasized how the erosion of trust leads to poor economic performance. Um, it uh, also tried to assess uh, determinants of trust uh, and what were the policies that could affect trust. Well, measuring trust is even harder than the other factors that I've identified, like insecurity um, and inequality. Uh, but again, there are both uh, objective and subjective measures. Uh, and uh, these have a high degree of replicability uh, and, show, and so can be used for, uh, uh, as a basis of uh, research uh, in economics. So, um, what I've tried to do in the last few minutes uh, has been to try to identify some of the important uh, dimensions of uh, economic perform performance and social progress that were left out in the, or given short shrift in the uh, overall metrics, the like GDP that have dominated uh, uh, the way we assess uh, how well we are doing. Uh, the fact that it, uh, our metrics don't give adequate attention to sustainability, to inequality, to trust, to security, um, to health, um, things that are of first order importance, both for individual well being and for uh, societal well being. Well, as I said before, this agenda is important because metrics affect what you do. And if you have the wrong metrics, you will do the wrong thing. Uh, and that's particularly important uh, in the policy agenda of building back uh, better. Let me illustrate uh, how misguided uh, metrics led uh, us to often make bad decisions. Um, the, in, in the context of uh, reforms of the welfare state, of social security, uh, attention was focused on uh, the budgetary aspects of social security. Um, but, uh, and Social Security, as many of you know, in the United States is what we call the old age uh, pension, uh, the pension system for, for our elderly. Um, so uh, there was even a, a, an attempt under President Bush to privatize the 
uh, public social security system. Well, the point of social security, old age pensions provided by the government is to enhance security, something that is extraordinarily important for people in old age. Our old age uh, pension system, our social security system, succeeded in almost eradicating poverty among the elderly. Uh, and uh, uh, the problem was the cutbacks in uh, and the privatization of the old age pension program and social security program that was proposed under President Bush threatened both of uh, these uh, uh, objectives, uh, metrics. Um, it uh, threatened security. Just think what would have happened if President Bush had been successful and Americans had been left to uh, that, uh, depend on the stock market for their security. In 2008, they would have lost all security and uh, they would have been left to fend, uh, too many would have been left in poverty. And almost surely the poverty rate among the old age would have increased significantly. Fortunately, President Bush failed in his attempt to privatize Social Security. Uh, just as an aside, it turns out that the government is far more efficient. Transaction costs are far lower than in the private sector. Um, why did the private sector advocate so strongly for the privatization of Social Security? Because they wanted to get those transaction costs. For them, transaction costs are their fees, the high incomes which they enjoy. Uh, so what was a cost to the old age was to them, uh, to old, a cost to the old age pensioners was to them uh, what they were uh, actually seeking to maximize, not to minimize. Um, so that's an illustration where, because we did not include the, any metric of security, any metric of poverty, and focused just on aspects of budget, uh, we didn't fully assess the cost of what privatization would have meant to our citizens. Fortunately, they grasped what was going on and uh, that attempt to at privatization was beat back. Now, uh, the importance of the green transition uh, can't be overemphasized. Uh, it's an existential matter. And so it is important as we uh, assess the policy agenda of building back better uh, that we do so, uh, we ensure that we are on track to uh, at least meet the goals of uh, carbon neutrality by uh, 2015. Um, one of the hallmarks of uh, the Biden administration's attempt uh, to build back better is uh, his commitment to make sure that the uh, money that is being spent is not only helping us move to, not only helping us recover, but moving us to a greener economy, but also a more inclusive society. Uh, so uh, metrics on poverty are going to play a very important role in assessing success. Uh, the forecast made by some of my colleagues here at Columbia University is that in one year alone, what the measures proposed uh, uh, in the $1.9 trillion rescue package uh, will uh, reduce childhood poverty by approximately 50%. Uh, 
country where our childhood poverty has been 20%, uh, reducing that in half is a marked achievement. And of course, if large fractions of your population are growing up in poverty with poor health, with lack of access to adequate education, it does not bode well for the future growth and prosperity of the country. So while those are things that may not be fully captured in the metrics that we're focusing on right now, the reduction of poverty, that future growth is obviously uh, a part of uh, what will be the success uh, of our country in building back better. Uh, I want to uh, spend just a minute talking about one of the concerns that has recently been raised concerning uh, the uh, agenda uh, of building back better. Uh, in the United States, uh, the Biden administration uh, has not only uh, succeeded in passing a $1.9 trillion uh, package to help the economy recover, uh, which together with what has previously been passed amounts to close to a quarter, 25% of GDP. Um, it's working. Uh, forecasts are that GDP growth uh, this year will be somewhere around six, 7%, possibly 8% and uh, putting us on, uh, on target to actually, uh, by the end of the year, be above the level of growth, level of, GDP, uh, of, of uh, economic performance that was anticipated before COVID uh, struck us. But today, uh, some uh, uh, critics of Biden are worried that uh, there will be inflation, uh, that the we will have an overheated uh, economy. Um, I think they're wrong. Uh, I think they're wrong on a number of scores, but one of the key things on which they're wrong is they're focusing on the wrong measures. Uh, you don't eat inflation. Inflation is an intermediary variable. It's important uh, in terms of how it affects other metrics that are more fundamental. Uh, material well-being is one of them. Incomes are one of them, but inequality, um, the other things that we're, we've been talking about are other things that are really important. And so we have to ask the question, uh, what is the likely effect of these measures on these things that are of greater importance? Well, I believe that uh, these policies taken together are likely to actually have a very positive effect uh, on uh, some of the metrics that are of real importance. Now, I almost hope that we have a slightly overheated economy because it's only when we have a very tight labor market that we have what is called wage compression, where wages at the bottom increase relative to those at the top. It is only when we have a tight labor market that we succeed in getting marginalized groups uh, into the labor force. Uh, and getting them uh, decent pay. So actually, a tight labor market will be good for our economy and for our society in terms of reducing inequality. I'm not worried also about inflation because as I look around the world, I see uh, uh, excess supply. Um, much of the world will not be recovering as quickly as the United States. Much of the world, in fact, almost all of the world, uh, has neither the fiscal space, 
nor the resolve to spend as much money as the United States has spent to have a strong recovery. And developing countries and emerging markets are uh, spending uh, not 24% of GDP, but numbers like 2% or 10% of GDP, a fraction of the amount the United States has spent, even though those some of those countries have been much bad, more, more uh, their economy has been much worse hit uh, by uh, the uh, pandemic uh, downturn. So that means that there is likely to be excess capacity in many parts of the world. Uh, yes, we are seeing uh, certain supply bottlenecks occurring in particular areas around uh, the economy, but that's always going to be expected when you shut down the economy, you try to restart it. Uh, it's not an easy matter getting the coordination that you need. And we have uh, supply shortages and say chips, but it's not because we were suffering from an overall undersupply, uh, a lack of capacity. It's just that we have to restart the economy after having uh, uh, shut it down. And that is uh, a difficult uh, task. But should it turn out that we uh, are facing uh, a period of uh, excess uh, uh, demand and that we have more inflation uh, than is acceptable, we have tools uh, to respond. For the last 12 years, we've had uh, near zero interest rates. Uh, that's uh, the opportunity cost of capital is not zero. The shadow price of capital is not zero. Uh, it is a, a misallocate, it results in misallocation of resources when we price capital at such a uh, low level. It's led to distorted pricing of risk uh, and overall distortions of the capital markets. So it would be much healthier for our economy and for our society if we interest rates were increased to more normal levels and we return from a negative real interest rates to a world where interest rates really reflect what the scarcity uh, that, uh, of capital as it is. We have other instruments too. Uh, we could and should be raising taxes. Uh, meeting the needs of our society requires more public investment investments in R&D, uh, in helping restructure the economy and addressing the problems of inequality, addressing climate change, the host of problems that I've identified uh, earlier in this talk. Uh, unfortunately, as a result of the uh, tax cuts that were uh, initiated under uh, President Trump, the share of GDP collected in tax revenues is not sufficient to finance the public needs that we have. Moreover, those tax changes were regressive, meaning the, today those at the very top pay a lower average percentage of taxes than those much lower down in the income distribution. And so if we had a tighter economy, we would be able to raise the taxes dampen any excess uh, uh, inflation if we had it, and uh, result in a better tax structure, a tax structure that could uh, be more progressive and help move the economy in the direction of a green economy. Well, I hope in these uh, few minutes that I've been able to uh, illustrate uh, how uh, getting better metrics helps one thinks about policy in a more comprehensive uh, way, in a better way, in a way that better reflects the multiple dimensions that uh, we need to create uh, the kind of society and the kind of economy uh, that we should be striving for. And so today, as we think of uh, this moment of reflection uh, in the after uh, the era of neoliberalism, after the failure, uh, the problems 
that COVID-19 has so exposed and exaggerate, exacerbated. Um, I think uh, this is a moment to build back better. And I hope the, the development of better metrics will help guide us in building back better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Joe. It's uh, fascinating as, as ever. And uh, it's always refreshing to see your approach where rather than sort of avoid or uh, deny the comp real complexity of what we're dealing with, you're, you're prepared to confront it and grapple with it and try and develop a, a framework that embraces all, all, of, all, all of the many variables involved. So we've got time for a short Q&A. So what I'd like to do is um, uh, introduce you to the panel. When I was putting this panel together, I was aware that um, one of the key resources we have in college, of course, are the 600 students or postgraduates we have, who not, not only are sort of because of their age, uh, have a natural interest in the long term, which is, is what a lot of these uh, ESG uh, um, issues are about, but also they are following degrees or doing research in areas that um, overlap with a lot of the fa uh, sort of topics you've been talking about. And they're not surprisingly, um, many of them have a, a, a definite interest in, in how this building back better might happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, rather than me stay around as chairman, I'm going to hand over first to Alex and ask her to introduce herself and then lead off with her questions and then move on to Arche. So if that's okay, I'll ask um, uh, Alex to start. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Stiglitz, for your fascinating talk. Um, my name is Alexandra Sadler and I'm a postgraduate student at Green Templeton College. I'm currently finishing up my second year of the MPhil in Development Studies and have focused my thesis research on how small and marginal farmers are integrated into agricultural markets in India. Um, and last year I also worked as a research assistant for the Smith School's Economic Recovery Program focusing on a greener post-COVID recovery. Um, so my first question is related to um, what you've been saying about how GDP is an insufficient metric for measuring economic performance and social progress. Um, so as you've mentioned, the post-COVID recovery phase presents an important opportunity to build back better, which includes moving away from these kinds of metrics towards more holistic measurements like the dashboard that you mentioned. Um, and yet in the post-COVID recovery, citizens will also be looking to GDP as a metric for how well their governments are doing at getting the economy back up and running. Um, so my question is, is now an opportune time to shift away from GDP as a metric or should we wait until confidence is restored? Um, and if now is the right time, how do you propose that we make that kind of a shift? Thank you. Yeah, a, a great question. Uh, my view is that you have to look at GDP. Uh, it's obviously going to be one of the numbers uh, that is in that dashboard that I referred to. But it would be a mistake not to look at what else is going on. Uh, if we, you know, in the in in the United States, and I think in many parts of the world, there's a lot of concern about what is called the K-shaped recovery. Uh, that the uh, pandemic itself really uh, hurt those at the bottom, and those at the top actually did very reasonably well. Uh, um, the, the adverse effects were really concentrated uh, at the bottom. Um, and uh, if we don't pay attention to the distribution effect, the distribution, the nature of the distribution of the recovery, uh, we could wind up with that K-shaped recovery. Uh, it would be very easy for those at the top to recover quickly. Uh, they've not had the devastating effects um, that uh, COVID-19 has had on those below. One particular aspect that uh, has worried many people has been the consequences of the uh, uh, moving to Zoom and dig, uh, of education. Uh, lots of evidence that uh, higher, uh, better off, uh, uh, families have been able to manage Zoom education better than those who are at the lower down in the income distribution. And uh, there are worries that missing out on 
uh, a months or a whole year of education will have long lasting effects. And so we'll have to think about how do we make up for that if that shows up. That's why I think it's really important. Um, if we are getting statistics that show that this educational gap uh, is persistent, is there and is persistent, I think we should be committed to having summer programs, to uh, after school programs, to doing what we whatever we can to close the gap that COVID-19 has opened up. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Okay, uh, Alex, I think looking at the clock, perhaps we could sw switch to Ache to ask his first question, please, and introduce himself. Ache? My name is Achampon. I am a third year doctoral student at the School of Geography and Environment and a member of Greentown Putin College. I am an entrepreneur, but I also conduct research in plant physiological ecology. I study how plants leverage trade-offs in response to threats and competition under limited resources to maximize productivity and survival fitness. I apply research insights as agroecology solutions to food insecurity in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, to ask my questions, I would like to give you some context. Recently, nearly half of the top fastest growing economies were from emerging economies. Corporations, academia, and other nonprofits whose um, operations are inherently motivated beyond natural, uh, national interest, uh, but by market dynamics or service to the common good are closing the gap, uh, global inequality gap. The alternative is exemplified by more than a decade's failure of call to action over multinational climate negotiations, and more recently, the US-China trade lack of unilateral consensus to a global pandemic, which led to hoarding of vaccines. Neoliberalism thus leverages free markets as a check and balance to solve seven state powers and remains a pragmatic way perhaps towards true globalization. My question, how do we reconcile the positive horizontal progress that neoliberalism contributes to globalization efforts, example, through market accessibility and fair competition? with the inevitable vertical income inequality gap that unregulated market powers aggravate? First, I, I think that uh, we've seen some of the uh, uglier sides of uh, unbridled profit maximizing behavior in uh, COVID-19. Uh, I referred a little bit earlier to the lack of resiliency, uh, that was uh, an incompetence of the private sector. Uh, but uh, we've seen one of the strengths of the private sector in the quick development of the vaccines. But we have to understand that that was basically the last mile based on publicly funded research that the basis of that, those vaccines was really funded by the government. It was a success of government more than of the private sector. It was a partnership, but we, which the government provided 98% and the, the private sector did the last mile. Uh, the last mile was really important and they did it very quickly, but uh, we should not underestimate the important role that the government played, both in the basic research, in the applied research, and financing the uh, uh, advanced uh, production uh, facilities. But since the vaccine was developed, we've uh, seen uh, the uglier side of neoliberalism and of the market economy. Uh, the vaccines that are available have not been widely shared. Uh, the developing countries have gotten a minuscule fraction uh, relative to their proportion in the population. Uh, the result of that is that uh, uh, some countries have been much more uh, badly afflicted, even when they've uh, undertaken a reasonably good uh, policies. Um, it has taken a long time 
for the developed countries to contribute to COVAX, the fund to provide for the vaccines. But the real bottleneck is the supply. And the drug companies have been will, unwilling to share their intellectual property with the developing countries and the emerging markets to maximize production. That's why the waiver that is being uh, on intellectual property that is being discussed in the WTO is so important. The drug companies say in an inconsistent way, the problem is not the waiver, but the incapacity of developing countries and emerging markets to use that knowledge. Well, if that were really the concern, let there be the waiver, and then they could show that the problem was not the intellectual property, but the ability to take advantage. The evidence is overwhelming that there are dozens and dozens of companies that could produce it in the developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, in India and in South Africa, uh, there are companies that could produce millions and millions of shots. And so uh, the real issue here is, and particularly true of the less complicated um, uh, 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 vaccines, but even the the chief, uh, the, the key scientists in uh, the companies have said that in a few months, uh, production of the mRNAs could be online. And you know what is difficult to discover may be very easy to produce. So that in fact, the production of some of these, if there were the transfer of technology, could be uh, uh, very rapidly brought online. So what we've seen is something that is, uh, uh, is uh, greed that is putting the whole world at risk because until the pandemic is brought under control everywhere, it represents a risk for all of us. We've seen how the COVID-19 mutates and the mutations can be more infectious, more dangerous, even more vaccine resistant. And so it is imperative for the world that the pandemic be as br brought under control as fast as possible. But from the point of view of the drug companies, their interest is monopoly profits. They want to restrict production. That's their number one goal and they are willing to let the world suffer in order to increase their profits. Uh, I say that with some passion because I, what they're doing is, is, is unconscionable in my mind. Um, and that's why President Biden has chosen to support the waiver uh, in, uh, of the intellectual property at the WTO. But the issue that we're talking about here is reflective of a broader issue, market power. Uh, we, neoliberalism is based on a set of hypotheses about how the economy works, based on a highly competitive market economy with information widely dispersed. But the evidence is that information asymmetries, market imperfections, and market power are pervasive. And the fight is over and over again about the rules of the game and how those rules of the game determine relative balance of power. For instance, in the United States, there's been a battle about the role of the companies that advise shareholders on who to vote for in proxy votes like at Exxon. The Trump administration wanted to restrict that provision of just information of who is a good, who is going to be a good director, who is going to support good environmental policies. Exxon obviously didn't want that kind of information out there. They wanted people not to know. The good news is that the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States has now said uh, it will not enforce uh, those uh, battle uh, those those kinds of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, regulations that uh, Trump tried to impose. And we're seeing what good information can do. We want the, there was a victory in the in getting better directors elected to Exxon, and that will change the direction in which uh, this very important company uh, goes in terms of the environment. Okay, again, looking at the clock, um, uh, Alexandra, do you have a follow-up question you'd like to put? Thank you, yes, that would be great. Um, so my second question for you was, um, you spoke about the importance of increased taxes during your lecture, and you've written elsewhere about the need for countries like the US to implement a wealth tax to enable wealth risk redistribution and the reduction of inequality domestically. Um, however, there are also enormous disparities between countries as well, which may be further exacerbated by the pandemic. So in the post-COVID recovery, is there a role for a global wealth tax to enable wealth redistribution across national borders to help us build back better at a global level? Um, if so, what might that look like? And if not, what are some other options for addressing global wealth disparities? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, uh, I wish we were in a kind of world where we could have a global wealth tax. Uh, I think it would be a good thing, but uh, that's uh, a long way, way into the future. And so the second question is really the relevant one. What can we do today? Well, the first thing is to uh, shut down the secrecy havens, uh, to shut down the mechanisms by which individuals and corporations avoid paying their taxes. Um, one of the big issues right now is uh, that's on the table is a global minimum corporate income tax. And uh, President Biden proposed a 21% uh, global minimum corporate income tax. I thought uh, the uh, it would have been better than 25%. Uh, but it looks like the world is compromising at a number lower than 21, more like 15 percent, better than the 12 and a half percent that was on the table before uh, uh, last year at the OECD. But uh, what worries me is that 15 percent is still too low and means the corporations won't be paying their fair share of taxes. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's really important that if that low rate of 15% is adopted, it be closely monitored to make sure that it's 15% on a very comprehensive definition of corporate profits and that they don't use all the gimmicks that they've used in the past to write down their corporate profits, you know, with rich companies pretending that they have no profits. So uh, we, if you have that minimum tax, it has to be on a robust definition of what corporate profits uh, mean. You know, I think that the advanced countries on their own, the big countries, Germany, UK, US, could just go ahead on their own and set the 21 or 25% global minimum tax. Uh, you know, uh, companies are going to want to operate in the United States and in Europe. Uh, that's where the sales are. That's where the profits are. So I think uh, uh, we should, the advanced, uh, th these rich, powerful countries should be setting the bar, should be setting it at 21%. And I think if we do that, rather than the race to the bottom that is characterized, the world uh, over in the era of neoliberal globalization will get a race that will move to the top uh, that will provide the funds that we need for uh, public investment, uh, for inclusive uh, green transition to build back better. Thank you very much, um, uh, everybody, and uh, Joe in particular. Now, at, at this stage, I'm going to just uh, say a, a few words of thanks to Joe. But before I do that, one question of my own, which is really a, 
I read in some biographical uh, material on you, Joe, that you describe yourself as a Midwestern optimist. Now, you see, I mean, all of the stuff we've been talking about, it could seem a bit overwhelming and push some people to pessimism, but clearly there's something in your background that means you're, you, you still see yourself as an optimist. Would, would you say that still holds true, true after COVID? Uh I, it still holds true. I, I, I think uh, if you're not an optimist, it'd be hard to keep going uh, in this world. Um, and uh, we're always grasping for those straws that give us the basis of that optimism. Um, in the United States, I think the election of Biden uh, is a basis of, uh, you might say, uh, grounds for optimism. Uh, the policies, the team he has put forward uh, is, uh, gives me uh, real optimism. The policies that he's uh, enacted in his first few months in office has given me uh, a basis of optimism. If I look around uh, at my students and the young people today and their commitment to agenda, the progressive kind of agenda that I've long supported, uh, their concern about the future, the concern about the green economy, about equality, inclusion, uh, that too gives me uh, grounds for optimism. Uh, perhaps I, I need to add that uh, in the United States, we are facing now uh, a moment of great pessimism. Uh, that what has happened with the Republican Party, the open warfare on democracy, their open attempts to make it more difficult for people to vote, their denial of the truth, their uh, um, uh, elevating mis- and disinformation, uh, treating it as if there is no such thing as the truth. Um, they're going back on the alignment, uh, centuries of progress based on science, advances in social institutions. Uh, they're going back on all of this. Uh, I never thought I would face this kind of, of uh, uh, movement in the United States. So um, if there were grounds for pessimism, I think uh, President Trump and the Republican Party has really given us grounds for pessimism. Okay, well, despite the qualification, I, there was an article in the Financial Times where somebody was saying, you know, you shouldn't judge America by its politics. It has amazing other strengths that seem to always carry it through. Witness the way it's done a maximum amazing vaccination program despite all of their concern for rights. So uh, I'm not from the Midwest, but I think I share some of your optimism. And it's my pleasure to sort of say thanks for a great talk. Thanks for making time in your busy schedule. And we look forward to um, some point in the near future where we hopefully get you in Oxford as originally planned. But the rest of the time, enjoy the Mediterranean. <laughs> well, now um, to close the proceedings, I'd like to hand over to the principal of Green Templeton College, Sir Michael Dixon. Thank you very much, Marshall. Uh, I'd like also to express my thanks to our speaker, Joe Stiglitz, for his fascinating presentation today. Uh, and to our two student questioners, Ache and Alexander. And of course, my thanks to, to Marshall Young for chairing this session so expertly. Um, I'm delighted that uh, Professor Stieglitz will be joining us in Oxford next year as our latest Sanjaya Lal Fellow. Uh, twice laid by, delayed by the pandemic, we very much look forward to having him around college in 2022. This has been a fantastic culmination to an excellent series of three Green Templeton lectures this year on the theme, Navigating the COVID Challenge. By next year, I also look forward to being able to welcome you to lectures like this in person once again, alongside continuing online events. And finally, 
My warmest thanks to the team at Franklin Templeton for their support of this series as part of a developing academic partnership. We're very grateful to you indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.